Section 1. You will hear a conversation between a man and a woman as the man joins a local library. First you have some time to look at questions 1 to 5. You will see that there is an example. This time only, the conversation relating to this will be played first. Hello, I'm new in the area and I'd like to join the library, please. That's no problem. Let me get an application form. Here we are. Now, all we have to do is fill this in and then I'll get you to sign it and you'll be a member. Great. Now then, what's your full name? Peter Adrian Camden. How do you spell Camden? C-A-M-D-E-N. C-A-M-D-E-N? Yes, that's right. So, Camden is the correct answer. Now we begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, as the recording is not played twice. Listen carefully to the conversation and answer questions 1 to 5. Hello, I'm new in the area and I'd like to join the library, please. That's no problem. Let me get an application form. Here we are. Now, all we have to do is fill this in and then I'll get you to sign it and you'll be a member. Great. Now then, what's your full name? Peter Adrian Camden. How do you spell Camden? C-A-M-D-E-N. C-A-M-D-E-N? Yes, that's right. Right. And what's your address? Flat 5, 53 Green Street, Finsbury. OK, got that. That's near here, isn't it? Yes, just five minutes' walk. What's the postcode? 7424, I mean, sorry, 7434. Got that now. Now, can you tell me your date of birth? 8th of July, 1976. And what's your telephone number? Well, I don't have a home number, but I've got a mobile. That'll do fine. It's 06634982746. Did you get that? Some of it. Can you say it again? The code's 06634, and the number's then 982746. Right. That's almost it. Now, I need some kind of identification to prove where you live. Do you have a driving licence, or a passport, or anything like that? I'm afraid that everything I have has got my old address on it. Do you need it now? No, not now, but you won't be able to take anything out until we see that. Wait a minute. I've got a letter addressed to me here that arrived this morning. Will that do? Oh, yes. That's a good idea. That will be fine. Let's look. OK. Well, that's finished. Before the conversation continues, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Now listen carefully and answer questions 6 to 10. Could I ask you a few questions? The council that runs the library is running a survey to find out what kind of books people prefer so that they can direct their buying. Yeah, no problem. OK, so what type of books do you like? Well, I'm very keen on mysteries, you know, when a detective is trying to find out who did the murder. Historical novels interest me too. Romance, never. My sister loves them, but they bore me to tears. I quite like books on animals, too. I get them out sometimes. Not science fiction, either. Too weird. Well, I think that's it, then. Good. Oh, do you charge anything? The library is free unless you want to rent out some of our videos or DVDs. And how much is that? Well, we rent videos out for $4 each, and DVDs are $6.
you must leave us a deposit of $60 as well. That's returnable, of course. I don't think I'll get any of those just yet. Can I pay later? Sure. Just give the money in when you're ready to rent them out. Well, thanks very much. You've been very helpful. I might take a book out now for the weekend, if that's OK. Go ahead. Well, goodbye. That is the end of section one. You will now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 2. Section 2. You will hear a radio presenter interviewing a doctor. First you have some time to look at questions 11 to 14. Now listen carefully to the interview and answer questions 11 to 14. Hello everyone. I've just been joined in the studio by Dr. Matthew Johnson. Dr. Johnson works at the Wesley General Hospital and he's here today to tell us all about giving blood. Good morning, Matthew. Good morning. So Matthew, why is it important for us to give blood? Donating blood is not important. It's actually vital that people do this. Without donated blood, thousands of people would die every year, and it's something that could affect everyone. We all expect blood to be there for us, but barely a fraction of those who can give do. Yet, sooner or later, virtually all of us will face a time of great vulnerability in which we will need blood, and that time is all too often unexpected. The need for blood is great. On any given day, an average of 38,000 units of red blood cells are needed. Blood transfusions are often needed for victims of things such as accidents and burns, heart surgery, organ transplants, and patients receiving treatment for leukemia, cancer, or other diseases. In 2002, nearly 29 million units of blood components were transfused, and with an aging population and advances in medical treatments and procedures requiring blood transfusions, the demand for blood continues to increase. We really need that much? Yes, and we need it now. Blood supplies nationwide have reached critically low levels, with less than one day's supply of several blood types. Thousands of accident victims, cancer patients, premature babies, and countless others who need blood to stay alive are hoping you'll care enough to help them. All blood types are needed. You now have some time to look at questions 15 to 20. Now listen to the rest of the conversation and answer questions 15 to 20. What are the different types? It's a bit more complicated than that. First we collect the whole blood from donors and then it's sorted into the different types which are basically O, A, B or AB, though there are also divisions here. Then the blood is split into its constituent parts. We divide it into four basic parts. First there are the red blood cells, then the white blood cells, then things called platelets, and finally plasma. This is shipped off to hospitals where they use the blood parts that the patients need. What are the different parts used for? Well, as I said before, the whole blood is your blood in its natural state, and something we rarely use. It's much more useful to us to have it separated into its component parts. Red blood cells are what everyone associates with blood, i.e. it's red. It's widely used to replace lost blood during surgery or when people hemorrhage. Its main function is to carry oxygen to cells. White blood cells are the most important part of the body's immune system. 
and they're used for patients whose normal defence systems aren't working properly. Platelets are crucial for making your blood clot and we need to give them to patients who suffer from illnesses that deplete their natural levels of platelets or they will bleed to death. Finally, plasma is what carries the other parts of blood around and needs to be administered with any of the other components. Take away the red blood cells and this is actually yellow. So that's what blood is all about. Now you're here in Westley today to collect blood. Can you tell us where and when we can donate? Of course. We're set up here today, that's Wednesday, and for the next two days at Westley General Hospital at the Outpatients Department. Come along between 9am and 4.30pm and we'll be able to deal with you within one hour. And let me tell you a few things that will calm your fears about giving blood. Aside from a brief needle prick, it doesn't hurt to give blood. Your body will replace the blood you donate within days of your donation. And finally, you can't catch AIDS, hepatitis or any other disease by giving blood. And of course, you get a cup of tea and a biscuit afterwards. And can anyone give blood? Almost everyone. Donors must be in generally good health, be at least 17 years of age, weigh no less than 110 pounds, have not received a tattoo within the past year and not have donated whole blood within the past 56 days. We screen donors with a series of questions before we take the blood, so if you're unsure, come down and we'll let you know. Please come down and see us. Remember, if you can donate one pint of blood, this can save up to three lives. Well, thanks, Matthew. I, for one, will definitely be going down to Wesley General to donate. That is the end of section two. You will now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 3. Section 3. You will hear a conversation between three people about use of university computers. First you have some time to look at questions 21 to 27. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 27. Hello there, do you work in the computer room? Yes I do, can I help you? Well I'm a first year and I know that I'll need to use the computer room for my work as I don't have a computer of my own. So I thought I'd get down here and see what I have to do in order to get time on one of the university's computers. OK, uh, there are four computer labs open to undergraduates. The others can only be used by the staff and postgraduates. The names of the four labs you can use are Wimborne, Franklin, Salisbury and Court. Wimborne and Court are in this building, the Johnson Building. Franklin is in the Computer Sciences Building and Salisbury is in the library. So I can use them whenever I like? Well, you can use them, but not whenever you like. As you can imagine, they're in quite a lot of demand, so you have to reserve your time on a computer. In each of the labs, there is a reservation book, and you can reserve your time on a computer in that for two hours daily. If a computer is free, though, you can go on it straight away. It's quite straightforward, but be sure to always write your name in the reservation book in pen, or someone can rub it out and put their name in instead. Oh my God, does that really happen? I'm afraid so, and far more often than you would think. When people are stressed about their assignments, they'd do anything to get some time on the computers. Better not try it yourself, though, or you'll be banned from the computers for the rest of the academic year, and your password and username will be taken away. That reminds me, I've got to get a username and password. How do I go about that, then? Well, what I'll do is to pass you over to my colleague Jane, as she's in charge of all that. 
Jane? Yes, Dave? I've got a new student here wanting to find out about usernames and passwords. Can you help him out with that? Yeah, sure. Hi there. Hi. Well, it's a straightforward process. First of all, tell me your name and I'll type it into the system. James Smith. Right. Let me do that. You see, all students are automatically given a username and then they just choose a password themselves. OK. So your username is James Smith 2 That's all small case. That means there must be more than one of you at the university at the moment. Well, what do you want your password to be? I think I'll choose biology, as that's the subject that I'm studying, though my girlfriend Mary will be upset that it's not her name I'm using. Well, that's all done. You can now use any of the four undergraduate computer labs. By the way, can I print out stuff at the labs? Yes, you can, but sometimes it's not quick. When you print, it goes into a queue and it'll be left in a tray in Franklin, as that's where all the main printers are. The good bit is that, although last year it cost three pence per page, now it doesn't cost you anything. You now have some time to look at questions 28 to 30. Now listen to the rest of the conversation and answer questions 28 to 30. I don't really know much about computing. Is there any training available? Yes, we have introductory courses for all new students. There is beginner, intermediate and advanced. Which would you like to go for? Well, I have done some, but I don't know if I'm up to anything more than beginner. I'd better stick with that. Intermediate could be too tough. Well, your course is in Franklin, then. We're in court now. You know where that is. That's in this building too, isn't it? No, that's Wimborne you're thinking about. Franklin's over in the Computer Sciences building. Anything else? I don't know what time the course starts. Let's have a look then. Advanced starts at 4.30 in the afternoon on Mondays, but yours is the day after at 5 in the afternoon. Are there any other times as I've got a part-time job then? Yes, you could try Thursday at 2pm. How's that? Even worse, as I have a tutorial then. Anything else? No, that's it. I'll have to rearrange work then. I can't miss the tutorial. That is the end of section 3. You'll now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 4. Section 4. You will hear part of a university seminar given by a student. First you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Good afternoon everyone. In today's seminar we are going to continue listening to different students giving us a presentation on the subject of their term paper. Now today is Hilary's turn. So what are you going to talk about today Hilary? Well, some of you will know that I was brought up when I was young in Japan and I'm going to do my term paper on Japan's bullet trains, which have revolutionised their rail industry. Japan's main island, Honshu, is covered by a network of high-speed train lines that connect Tokyo with most of the island's major cities and Fukuoka on the island of Kyushu. Japan's high-speed trains are called Shinkansen, but are known to us as bullet trains. 
The Japanese bullet train system is credited with being the world's first purpose-built high-speed railway and the model and inspiration for all other similar type systems running today, such as the French TGV. The reputation it has earned for safety, speed and punctuality is unsurpassed. I'd like to give you some figures about that. As regards safety, there has never been a death on the bullet train system since its inception in 1964, other than that caused by deliberate passenger misadventure. As far as speed is concerned, the bullet train holds the current world record for the fastest average speed between two station stops, which was 261.8 kph between Hiroshima and Kokura. The train travelled 192 kilometres in 44 minutes. This record is from the 500 series Nozomi trains, running at a maximum speed of 300 kilometres an hour between Shin Osaka and Hakata. I'll talk more about them later. The punctuality puts European train services to shame. Most trains arrive at their destination after several hours to within the second. In one year, the total time that all bullet trains were late by was 12 seconds. This statistic is hard to believe, but it would be difficult to prove otherwise, and that's what the rail authorities in Japan have told us. Now I'd like to tell you a bit about their history. The first bullet train was introduced in 1964 by Central and West Japan Railways for the Tokyo to Osaka route. Most of these old trains have now been discontinued. There have been several bullet train models since then. The most recent ones have been the 300, 500 and 700 series. And it's the 500 series one that can travel at 300 kph. The bullet trains operating in Japan today are of the three following categories. Nozomi, Hikari and Kodama. The Nozomi trains stop only at the most important stations and reach Osaka from Tokyo in only about two and a half hours and it's the most modern of bullet trains that serve as Nozomi. Hikari trains stop a little bit more frequently than Nozomi trains and need roughly three hours to reach Osaka from Tokyo. Kodama trains stop at all stations and they are the local trains among bullet trains. Older models of bullet trains serve as Kodama. I'd like now to talk a little bit about the technology involved in bullet trains. The Shinkansen bullet trains consist of electrically powered cars. That means basically all individual cars are equipped with electric motor driving systems. This is in contrast to locomotive trains in which the locomotive pulls the passenger coaches. The realisation of the high-speed Shinkansen with the electric train system had a great significance. The French Train à Grande Vitesse, or TGV, runs on a centralised power system in which the heavyweight, high-output locomotives at both ends pull the passenger coaches. It's a system suitable to European railways, which run basically on straight tracks in wide plains with solid foundations. However, it is unsuitable in Japan, where the ground is flimsy and the tracks full of curves and undulations, and intercity distances are short, making it necessary for the trains to accelerate and decelerate frequently. One of the advantages of the electric car system is that the motor functions as a brake to reduce the speed of the train. When the power feed to the electric car motors is stopped, the wheels continue revolving, keeping the motors rotating, resulting in electricity generation by magnetic induction. As the force acts in the direction opposite to the axle's motion, it functions as a brake to the train. All the motors equipped on each coach can be utilised effectively to reduce the speed, making the electric train system advantageous on Japanese railways, which involve frequent deceleration and acceleration. In addition, by virtue of the remarkable progress achieved recently in semiconductor technologies, the electric train system has undergone tremendous improvements in power, operability and safety administration, so the system is becoming increasingly advantageous. That is the end of section four. You'll now have half a minute 
to check your answers. That is the end of the listening test. You now have 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the answer sheet.